that took some, dare I say, balls <laughs> to do. You probably said we've got plenty of them as well, aren't you? Um, but, you know, when I talk about courage, this next uh, guest of ours, I think we must be paid a huge amount of respect for coming today to speak to us. Now, I've known this chap for many, many years, and he's going to reveal some information about me today, which he was a bit sceptical about whether he should, but I'm pleased for him to tell the truth. Um, he's without doubt the bravest person in this room by a long shot. As a former practicing solicitor, he now works as a legal director for two companies, one of which works with insolvency practitioners and advising on whether or not debtors have been victims of, mal of bank malpractice, including the extremely sensitive PPI uh, claims frenzy. Having known Matt Percy for many years and working together with my many compliance issues such as FSA authorization, I can honestly say he's one of the most straightest, most honourable people that I know. He's also a whiz at getting off speedy charges as well. That is one for the bar afterwards, Mark. Um, sorry, I've got to say actually, yeah, just, I've got, I've got to tell this story. I was up for a speeding charge, 106 miles an hour. Not proud of it, and I need you know snookers to get out of this one. There was a story behind it, and I'm sure we can elaborate on that one later. But as I'm walking out of the courtroom, the emotion took over. And I actually said to the magistrates, who are you to stand in judge and jury over me? To which one of them actually burst out laughing. Um, and he said, come on, Paul, you better get out quick before you go down for contempt of court. Um, but no, joking apart. So seriously, before the soggy tomatoes and rotten cabbages come flying his way, I asked you to consider two things. One, he's here on his own accord. Nobody has forced him to come, right? Which I think, again, commands a tremendous amount of respect. But also, um, he's here to give you some valuable inside knowledge, um, you know, about how you can all stove off bogus claims. Because going back to my Vince Cable point before, I mean, I, I still am spellbounded by his reaction. Um, so, Ladies and gentlemen, um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the, uh, to the stage the very best of order, please, and respect for Mr. Mark Hollingshead. The Jaws music didn't come on. I'd ask for the Jaws music at this point. There we go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> No music next year. Is that it? That's right. it. <laughs> Afternoon. <laughs> Lovely to be here. I feel a little bit like the gentleman who's putting up the hog roast at a bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start. Actually, we've, we've managed something unique in our company. We've managed to come up with a business model where almost everybody hates us. And it's saying quite a bit of difference. As Abby explained, we do financial irregularity claims, but we do it in the insolvency industry, which means that every client that we work for is in an IBA. And it's taking me back to what our friend from Blue was saying earlier on. He recognises, I think, as much as we did, that it's quite a unique marketplace, the IBA marketplace. So we have a client who is never going to see the result of their PBI claim. That money goes back to increase the dividend paid to the other creditors within the IBA. So from that point of view, I'm pleased to say that you've probably never heard of me, and you probably never will. And the reason for that is that most motor finance lies outside the IBA. Um, we only look at debts within the IBA arrangement, and if somebody has got motor finance, normally that car will be needed to go to work. If they don't go to work, they don't turn the money, they don't pay the contributions into the IBA, so the whole thing collapses, and the insolvency practitioner doesn't earn any money. So obviously they're not very interested in including motor finance in the IBA, so you've probably never heard of us. The client hates us, of course, because they think that the £2,000 that Lloyd's TSP is due to pay should come to them. They're overlooking the fact that they had a credit card with £10,000 with Lloyd's TSP and they're going to pay £4,000 of it back under the IBA. But they still think they should get the £2,000 that goes into the IBA. But that's the public for us. That's why we love them. So. Um, what I want to do today is just talk briefly about a couple of issues. Uh, one is really to say, don't lose heart that everybody's out to get you. There are the occasional rulings and cases that actually are quite sensible and are, and are in favour of the sellers. Um, there's a case that you may be familiar with. It's a case called Green Hill Yes Welcome Finance and ACF 
there's nodding from Fred at the front. I apologize for calling you Fred. We haven't met before, but everybody seems to call you Fred. <laughs> seems to be the way of it. Um, in this particular case, Mr. Greenhill brought a claim for PPI mis-selling against ACF Car Finance as the seller, alleging breach of ICOB, and against Welcome Car Finance under the unfair relationship provisions of the Consumer Credit Act. That's not something you would have to worry about unless you were the credit provider. Um, so I'm concentrating primarily on the allegation against ACF Car Finance. And I'd like to introduce you to a, a guy called District Judge Wright. Now, District Judge Wright sat at the Liverpool County Court. This case was in October 2010. He's an unusual character, District Judge Wright, because he's a judge with a bit of common sense. And in this particular case, a couple of the allegations that were made, I won't go through all of them because it's a bit boring to do that, but a couple of the allegations that were made were that the lump sum premium policy was unsuitable for Mr. Greenhill by its nature. And what the judge said was that he didn't agree with that assumption. He said, look, Mr. Green is looking to do two things here. He's a subprime borrower, he's got a poor credit record, so what he's looking to achieve, is obviously wants to borrow the money to buy the car, we all understand that, but the other reason he wants the loan is to repair his credit rating. He wants to be able to demonstrate that he's taken, borrowed this money and he's paid it back throughout the term of the loan. On that basis, to me, as a judge, it seems perfectly reasonable to sell him the lump sum policy because that will enable him to do that. We all know the argument that if you are paying the insurance on a monthly basis, as soon as you get into financial difficulties, probably the first thing you're going to chop is the insurance policy. If his difficulties carry on, they get worse. The next thing he does is default. The judge said this way, as far as I'm concerned, in theory, that's not going to happen. So he struck out that side of the claim, and ACF won on that one. The other argument that was used was that, well, it's just expensive, isn't it? At the end of the day, look at the rate that's being charged. We do know, I believe that somebody used to work for Welcome here, so I've got to be careful what I say, but we do know some of Welcome's rates could be fairly hefty. The complaint was, why was it sold at that rate? And the judge says, well, hang on a minute, that's not ACF's fault. That's not the reason he's paying the interest rate. The reason this guy's paying that interest rate is the circumstance he finds himself in. He's got a poor credit rating, he's a subprime borrower, that's why he's paying the rate, that's why it's expensive, that's not your fault as the dealer. So again, he struck out that side of the claim. So bear in mind that the Financial Ombudsman Service can look at the law. They can look at decided cases when they're deciding how to proceed. So it's, it's a case that's worth mentioning if anybody comes along on that. And bear in mind that under the DISP rules as well, you can use a little bit of hindsight. You don't necessarily have to show that that was the advice that was given at the time. You have got a bit of a get out because you can now argue that the client would still have purchased the policy, even taking all the circumstances into account. So you can raise that at a later date if you need to. So it's worth bearing in mind. If anybody, if anybody wants any details on that in the future, they can contact Andy and I can email them the information. I'm not, as you say, I'm a bit of a technophobe. I'm not bothered with any problems that press does. Obviously, Chinese demonstrated they don't always work. Um, <laughs> the other um, the other area I just wanted to, to discuss is the um, the issue of the, the alternative compensation for the lump sum premium. Um, is anybody familiar with the uh, DISP Rule 3.7 regarding how you can approach this? The blank faces and shaking your heads looking at me. I'm surprised this isn't used more. I mean, we, we deal primarily with the high street banks. And uh, obviously in loan cases, we're looking at lump sum PPI. And this was an amendment that was introduced by the FSA uh, going back to 2010. <coughs> Uh, where they changed the way in which you could approach PPI redress with a lump sum and they said look you can do two things here you, you can assess first of all whether the client would have bought PPI was he eligible for PPI in the first place was he employed no pre-existing conditions did he have no sick pay that's fine we can deal with that side of it but the other side you can look at is whether the lump sum premium was appropriate or not and you can actually divorce the two from each other so what you can say is Okay, we accept maybe that the lump sum premium wasn't appropriate in this particular case, but we still think the guy would have bought PPI as a product. There was nothing wrong with PPI. Let's get this straight. There is nothing wrong with PPI as a product. It's a good product. It's a good idea to make sure you insure yourself against the risk of default. Nobody's complaining about that. So what they said is you can take an alternative approach. And what you can say is that he would have had PPI, therefore he would have paid for it he would have paid an amount of money if he'd had a monthly policy. Now, okay, he's had a lump sum one, and we're going to calculate what that redress payment would be. But what we're allowed to do here is knock off the cost of the PPI. Now, you're probably thinking to yourselves, well, how the bloody hell do you know what the cost of the PPI would have been in the first place? And you don't, is the short answer. So what the FSA did was they came up with a formula. And the initial formula they came up with was to say, for every £100 of monthly repayment that you're insuring, you can take a notional £6 premium. 
Now the banking industry objected to that, uh, said it wasn't enough, and after a bit of argy-bargy that's gone up to £9. So effectively, if you've got a client who's put in a PPI claim and uh, you are minded to reach a settlement, but what you can do is say, well, his monthly payment would have been £300. So for that £300 loan repayment, we can apply a notional £27 per month that he would have paid as a monthly payment, and we can knock that off. So you can get to your gross figure, you can deduct if it was a three-year three year term, you can take 27 times 12 times 3, which is 900 and something quid off the top of my head, you can knock that off. The other thing you should do, I would think, in those circumstances, is knock it off before you add your 8% interest on. Because he would have paid that money there and then at the time. So that would have come out of his pocket, so he's not deprived of that money, he would have paid it over the term of the loan. And as you all know, if you're working these things out, that 8% can be a hefty sum, if you're not careful. So if you can knock it off at that stage, that 900 quid saving in that example could equate to a saving of over £1,000, 1,500 quid by the time you finish spending on how far you go back. So it's always something to look at. And it amazes me that our mainline banks do not do that. And it's there, it's in the rules, they're perfectly entitled to do it, they can save themselves millions of pounds, but they choose not to. So don't you make that mistake, you make sure you take advantage of that. It's in the rules, it's DISP 3.7, again, I'll put it on a piece of paper, and if you know it too, if anybody wants to deal with that later on. Um, probably the, the other pressing topic that arose from something Fred said earlier on today, and that the early discussions, is time scales. I don't think there is a final view on time scales, if I'm being honest, after a while, that's unusual. Um, I think the, we all know what the rules say. The rules say that you've got six years from the date in which the act that you're complaining of took place, in which to make your claim. We all know, again, probably that the type of pre-PPI product people are unhappy with came to an end towards the end of 2008. There wasn't really anything sold much after that time. So applying the six-year rule to that, that's going to take you to 2014. Of course, many of the products that were sold are going to be sold well before that date. There's a lot in 2005, 6, 7, of course, and they're going to be at the end of the, the six-year period, either already or in the very near future. So we didn't worry about a lot of those. The other rule that probably causes us the bigger problem is the three-year rule. And the three-year rule says that you can bring a claim within three years of the time when you were aware that you had a potential claim. This is going to be the more interesting one because I think this is something that's going to crop up over the next couple of years in particular as to when that three years hits. The problem is that each case is judged on its own facts. So any individual claimant can come back and argue their case about when they had actual knowledge of it. So you could have somebody who comes back and says, well, I've just spent five years in Borneo, and everybody heard of the PPI scandal, what's all this about? But apparently I had a loan agreement in 2005, and they can raise the issue then. However, for the vast majority of consumers in this country, they're going to be have knowledge imported to them for the situation as it is at the moment. So I suppose the big question is, at what point do we say everybody would have been aware so your three-year clock starts to run at that point. As somebody said earlier on, you know, we're all getting five text messages. Don't, we don't do text messages, by the way, can just say, because we work with this office, we don't have to bother. So you all get one of us. So you're all getting five of these a day, and they're all telling you about PPI. At what point can you hold your hand up and say, I wasn't aware that this PPI issue was there? Um, my own personal opinion, it's only a personal opinion, but my personal opinion for what it's worth is that the cut-off point will probably be April 2014. That may be not what you want to hear. Fred's nodding whether he agrees particularly with that date. You have to have an answer. That's yeah. The reason I say that is that the judicial review brought by the banks into the FSA's revised rules for the selling of PPI was decided in April 2011. So at that point it became clear that the banks were going to have to deal with PPI properly. And they were going to have to deal with it on a set formula, on a new set of rules set out by the FSA. And as we all know, once the British Bankers Association, initially through Lloyds, were the first to pull out, the rest of the BBA then went, that, that was the law effect of that judicial review wasn't appealed. So I think it's very difficult. That, that really sort of started to open the floodgates for a lot of the PPI claims as well. So I think it's reasonable to say, by the time you get to three years from then, why would anybody not be aware that they were, able, they were going to be able to make a PPI claim? Because everything had been on hold before then, you may all recall, obviously, there'd been this big hiatus where people weren't dealing with things because they were waiting out from this judicial review. Well, that all stopped. Everybody gets back on the bandwagon again and off they go. So I think it's reasonable to say by the time you get to the three-year period from then, if I were a bank, I'd be arguing this at that point. Because once you argue it, you chuck the owners back onto the punter to say why they didn't bring the claim within the three years. So you're reversing the burden of proof to a degree. 
So it's always worth doing as a tactic. So just my opinion for what it's worth. Probably a little longer than you'd hoped <laughs> for the answer, but I think there's a logic to it there that, that can be approached. Um, just as a final point, that the, um, I'm just thinking back to when Andy and I first started, just going back to the point he was making, uh, the, the, the bit he was alluding to before was that when we first started off with this stupid idea of trying to go into the IBA market, and everybody said, well, that'll never work, because the bank will just knock it off the deck, and we managed to persuade them, but they couldn't. Um, and we went to Andy with this stupid idea, and we said, Andy, uh, we've got a good idea, so we want to invest some money in this business. Uh, and he could have done, I mean, no bones about it, he could have done, but he said, no, I can't really, he said, it doesn't sit with what I do. So that's the sort of guy you're dealing with, with Andy, and without wishing to, to brag, he would have made a fair bit of money had he done so. So, I'd like Andy. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask the government e cap? So, yeah, okay, I think. Um, I am not. Right, please, Jack. Oh, sorry, I apologise. Just in mind, one of the issues that we do get with banks is that the, we, when Andy and I went, we're going back to 2004, we used to go around to motor dealers and sort of tell them about this report under the FSA that was going to come and I was going to hit them in 2005, and they all used to look at us like we were sort of the little and large version of the Grim Reaper, and they just sort of wandering into the showroom telling them how it was all going to be. And. Um, Obviously, so it turned out in the end. Um, you know when you get to 50, and you yeah. lose your train of thought halfway through a sentence, because I'm not really that long, just happened to me that, so I apologise for that. <laughs> 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 now, the other, the other point about regulators, it was about regulators, really. I mean, in 2004, we all thought that the FSA was the food standards agency. We never heard of the other one. <laughs> Unfortunately, times got worse from that point of view. Um, but the other regulator we forget about sometimes is our little cuddly friend who's the um, data protection regulator. And you can use data protection sometimes because certainly it happens to us with the banks all the time is that if we send a complaint in on behalf of somebody and if the name isn't exactly the same, if the address isn't exactly the same and if the signature doesn't match the documentation you've got, kick it back. Ask for proof. Just say, well, let's have proof of a change in name. Let's have proof of that change of address. And quite frankly, I don't like the look of that signature, so I want that verified by somebody. We have regular meetings with uh, representatives in the banks. The banks have finally realised that it's in their interest to actually work with some of the claims management companies who they don't find quite so objectionable. Because when you see that Barclays have set aside £3 billion to deal with PPI mis-selling, that's not to pay back to the punters, or some of it is, but probably half of it, so a third, third to a half, is to administer it. So if you can sort something out with Barclays where you're not writing 3,000 letters to them a week and they're sending 3,000 back with all the leaflets and everything, if you can do it on a spreadsheet, they love it. That's the way they would prefer to do it. But you know, you're perfectly entitled to ask for verification on all of these points. Um, and don't forget, if you do that, your eight week period hasn't started to run. So you're not even looking in, into whether or not you're gonna be outside your eight weeks and have the FSA on your back for that. If you, they have to prove who they are to you, uh, and if they don't, just reject the claim. Uh, that happens to us all the time, and we accept that point, that we're perfectly entitled to do that. <coughs> so, um, I don't want to say too much more, because I suspect I may have one or two questions. <laughs> so, uh, I'll leave Andy to go around with the, with the mic. It's at this point where I expect a huge show of hands. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I mean, being in the debt market, um, I just understand exactly what's happening with the IBA market with PPI, yeah. and, and I think it is a great option in the P in the IBA market because people don't suffer on that. You know, it's, it's no. a better approach than um, lenders being hit big time with it. You know, but is the business right at the moment on the same on, on the insolvency work? The mis selling has started to the mis selling claims of the CMC companies are going to start attacking mortgages being mis sold. We've, we've had, had a few this... scary thoughts where yeah, we're somebody had... was an interest only and wasn't given a repayment vehicle on a mortgage. That would be seen as missold when you're talking 30 grand claims. You are. Um, one, of the, it, one of the difficulties of doing a mortgage mis-selling claim compared to doing the PPI is what a lot of claims managers want to do is do this thing on the industrial scale. They just like to be able to bang the letters out. The claims managers couldn't like everybody else, they're lazy. What they want to be able to do is write one letter and wait for a check. That's what they're looking to do. Mortgage mis-selling, I think, is, a, is going to be a little bit harder for them because it's a lot more complex deciding whether a mortgage is appropriate for somebody. Um, 
So if they're going to go down that line, I think they're going to have a lot of more background information. I mean, one of the things that we look, we don't just look at the at, um, PPI misselling, as Andy alluded to, is our business. We look at everything that the bank may have done to the customer who's in the insolvency arrangement to see if there's anything that they've done that's improper, and that includes overcharging and everything. One of the things that we did look at briefly was the credit default swap issue. Anybody familiar with that? The old bit of nodding of head. Yes, James and Julia. Yeah. Um, now that that's a very tricky area. I mean, the. the the figures on that are massive. You know, you look at a business could be asked to pay a million pound exit charge. A fairly small to medium sized business could be asked to pay a million pounds to exit a credit default swap agreement. Uh, and the financial ombudsman service has jurisdiction, albeit they're limited to £150,000 themselves. But so you're looking at some big money on that, but they're massively complicated. And I think, although in principle I agree with mortgage mis-selling, and people have been talking about mortgage mis-selling in our marketplace now for upwards of two years possibly at this claims, but we've never really seen it take off. I could be wrong, but it's a lot harder for a business to set up. Most claims management companies are marketing companies. They're not particularly clued into the more complex areas of financial legislation. The reason they succeed in PPI is because the regulators made it easy for them to do it, as you all know. I mean, one of the problems we've got, Mark, at the moment is taking Miss Selly to Miss Selly. I mean, mm. as a debt management company, if we didn't offer somebody a PPI reclaim facility, to be able to pay the debt back quicker, we would then be deemed to have missold the debt management. So yeah. the claims industry is getting worse, it's going towards and going, you've now missold the ability, that you've missold the fact you've not sold a missell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, yeah. where does this end? It gets a bit, it it gets a bit and circular. And one it? of our employers, <laughs> and himself, who looks after all our protection on the other side of BPI, mm. is now working for one of the big banks to work out if a debt management company hasn't offered a PPI claim to reduce the debts within the yeah. IBA, then Black, uh, the DM will potentially be sued for um, it, not giving the right advice. It's certainly an issue that the insolvency practitioners have been addressing over the last... We're probably getting a bit esoteric here between the two, but sorry, I'll just talk yeah, about that. I was wondering anybody else is vaguely interested in this. Yeah, a lot of the insolvency practitioners have reached the same conclusion. They, they start off by being a little bit cagey about it, and then the word started to get out to say, well, hang on a minute, if you don't pursue it, then at the end of the day, the, the, what you might call the innocent creditors within the arrangement are losing out, because the, the winner will be the guilty creditor. Uh, and because it's not the, the sort of person who's in debt who's going to get the money, then a lot of the time, like the FSA, the FOS, and the, and the courts take a more sanguine view of it and say, well, if it's going to go back to pay the other creditors, that's fine, you know, we're happy with that. So I think they will come under pressure from that point of view. Just as a matter of interest, we, we did a trial for the official receiver at one stage because uh, they were looking at PPI banks. So they were taking it, official receiver, let's get this straight, they're interested in having the fees paid, not interested in anything else. They don't really care about the credit for safety reasons, it's rather controversial. But they're, what, they, what they're looking to do is make sure they cover their costs and, enough in it. and they were hit by the drop in property prices because most of the official receiver's fee recovery, am I running it over running? <laughs> Most of the official receivers' fee recovery is when people sold, when they took the house off people and sold it, all of a sudden the drop in property prices meant everybody's in negative equity. So they decided to have a dip at PPI to see if they were going to make any money from that. And we were, we were chosen to do a trial for them. We worked with three offices of the official receiver. I think we recovered on average on each bankruptcy file between 1,000 and 1,500 quid, which would have paid for the official receiver. Now, this is taxpayers' money we're talking about here. This is what you and I are paying to cover this cost because the official receiver is a public cost. Any bankruptcy that has an asset in is touted out to the accountants who do it, and they take their fees out of it. Most bankruptcies have no assets in them. 90% of bankruptcy got no asset in it whatsoever. That's dealt with by the official receiver, and we all pay for that. And we proved to them that we could have made that self-funding for the next few years in the bankruptcy, and we did about 600 cases for them, proved it, and they dropped it. <coughs> I think there's possibly an element of politics in that, to be fair. Well, they should have spoken to Vince Cable. Yeah, he yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't have understood. Would <laughs> yeah. Mark, I've got Richard Hogg out of the issue. I'd like to ask you a question. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Hi. Have you, as an organisation, discussed at any point potential opportunities for your company for the European Consumer Credit Directive in the future? No, because we're not <laughs> enough. <laughs> Another year we're out of it. We're, we're not looking to go into any other areas once this is done, to be honest. We've got other <coughs> business areas, not to do with social housing, frankly, but just going in a completely different direction. Well, that's the way you're well, this way, yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not going to be involved in that. Um, I mean, there are other areas are talked about all the time when we talk to claims management companies. It was interesting when we had the, when we had the chat with Barclays periodically, we had like a monthly conference call with them, and one of the questions they, they asked bluntly, they say, what else are you looking at? 
you know, they're trying to get themselves up to what might be coming next. They say, are you going to do this? Are you going to do that? And we say, no, we're not. But uh, there are, I mean, I think, I think PPI is the perfect product for a claims management company, the way it, it operates. It's going to be harder to deal with a lot of the other stuff later on in terms of the way that the rules are written and everything. So a bit like saying about the commissions. I mean, I wouldn't over worry about the commissions if you get your act together from here on in. Obviously, there's been a history of commissions being paid in the industry, and there was a, there was a case going back to 2007 called Wilson and Hurstang, which was all about secret commissions. And all the lawyers were jumping up and down, and the CMC was jumping up and down, thinking, my God, this is going to be a money spinner. Look at the amount of money that's flowed around in commissions through the industry over the years. Well, nothing came of it. Nothing came of it. The judges didn't like it. And the judges can stamp on these things very quickly if they want to do it was all based around the fact that there's a fiduciary relationship between the broker and the client. And almost every case that's gone to court, they've said, no, there isn't a fiduciary relationship. You don't have a commission disclosure obligation. So I, I wouldn't be overly worried about historic commission disclosure issues. I don't think that's going to come and bite you on the bum. Um, moving forward, I mean, the Bribery Act uh, is a criminal act. It doesn't give rise to civil liability, but I agree with you, it's something that could get you into trouble if you get it wrong, but it's not going to give rise to the civil liability. OFT, again, it's not, they're not rules. I mean, we have the, we have the similar issue with the, with the credit card default charges, which is an OFT issue, and we used to reclaim the credit card default charges, which were, were pretty hefty in some cases. Actually, all our clients are in default because they're all insolvent. Um, but that was an OFT matter. And it was a lot more flexible, there's a lot more wriggle room on something like that because it's all down to opinion, reasonableness, everything else like that. What you've got with PPI is a set of very, very stringent rules and written paperwork that should be contemporaneous and can be looked at. It's a little bit harder with some of the other stuff to do it. And you've got to be able to quantify your loss. Easy to quantify the loss with PPI because the regulator tells you how to do it. Get onto some of your other areas. How do you, how do you quantify the loss with mortgage miss Sally? Say you miss sell a mortgage to somebody, but they bought a house with it in 2005, and that house is now worth a lot more money than it would have been worth before, even though on the face of it, they couldn't afford the mortgage repayments. So if they end up selling the house pocket 30 grand, what have they lost? So, you know, it's never that easy. It's, it's, it's not that easy. The PPI has just been so simple because the regulator's just giving it everybody on a plane. <coughs> Mark, I've got uh, Paul Hibbert from um, Evolution Funding. Hi Mark, uh, what's your view on uh, gap and warranty uh, ambulance chases? Is that, is that the next thing around the corner? Uh, I was aware of gap and warranty originally through Andy because he used to work for, uh, who's Andy, do you remind me? For a long time, a warranty holding. Warranty holding, yeah. <laughs> so I was aware of the markup on that. I suspect there isn't enough in it for the CMCs. I don't think there's enough money in the product. You're looking at what, a, a, a £400 on average, what would it be? 350, 400 quid, 500 quid policy. There's got to be a margin in it for them for the amount of work that they do. The most CMCs, their main cost is marketing. You look at, you know, you've seen the television advertisement, all the campaigns that go with it, there's a hell of a cost in that. A massive amount of their turnover. They've got to be able to make the return on that. I don't think the margin will be there in GAP uh, or any of the other products. Uh, that were associated with PPI at the same time to make it worth their while doing it. You know, it's the conversion cost that will probably make it uneconomic for them. So again, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Guys, over about time, you know, this is a, I think it's really valuable information and, uh, you know, I really thank you for coming back for doing this. Uh, so keep the, the questions coming. Oliver Mackinas from Billing Finance, man. Sorry, I know we're kind of giving you a list of things that we're worried about. I'm just, um, <laughs> Responsible lending, affordability issues, yeah. uh, people going into IVA or arrangements. Should we have been able to you know, see the future? Is that going to be an issue? No, and again, I don't think it is particularly. Um, the, you know, the rules on this are going to be fairly recent. Um, so looking at it historically, the position was a lot more woolly. I mean, look at all of them. Bear in mind the politics of a lot of this. The government are not meant to want to open the door to huge amounts of claims against the banks again. They're stuck with PPI, there's nothing they can do about it. But they're going to be very, very careful not to put the banks under financial pressure again. So they're not going to encourage a scenario where you can go to a bank and accuse them of irresponsible lending. I mean, we look, I mean, it was bloody irresponsible. We look down the list in the IBAs and you'll see somebody's got six credit cards from Lloyd's TSB. You think, you know, how the hell did that happen? Okay, I know there is an explanation sometimes because Lloyd's TSB bought a book that was a store car previously or something like that and they, they can acquire it that way. But you think, how does that happen? So I don't think irresponsible lending is going to be a, a big deal. 
Uh, there's no reported case on it. There was, there was one case against Blumain Finance that settled out of court um, on, a, on a mortgage, sort of mortgage mis-selling argument, but there's no judgment on it, so there's no legal precedent on it at the moment. So again, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Mark, I've got Fraser Brown from Border. Hi, yeah, we've had a few judgments from the Financial Ombudsman um, <laughs> relating to the sale of vehicles on finance, where they could turn around and say the vehicle was mis-sold. They don't seem to be based on reasonable evidence or anything. It all seems to be based on very <coughs> woolly kind of interpretations of what he said, she said. What kind of rules do they work to? They have a very, very broad remit in terms of how they look. If you look at the, def the definitions contained in the Financial Service and Market Act 2000, and it that like creates the Financial Service Ombudsman. And the relevant section in there which says how they decide, it says they decide on the basis of what is fair and reasonable. And it's difficult to imagine anything more woolly than that. So unfortunately, you tend to be at the mercy of the person who just answers the query. I mean, I've seen it the other way around. I mean, I saw a situation once with um, Ocean Finance, who sold uh, you know a 25-year mortgage with a five-year lump sum PPI that was going to cost an arm and a leg, and we sent that into the ombudsman, and they came back and said, "No." So there's no logic to it a lot of the time. And you think, well, bloody hell, these are the people who should be nailing at the end of the day. <laughs> So there isn't always a logic to it, I'm afraid, but that, that is the problem, that they, they decide what is fair and reasonable. There are guidelines, it says you look at the law, you can quote cases to them, they're supposed to look at the evidence and attach relevant weight to the evidence, but at the end of the day, I'm afraid the way the system works is on the adjudicators, say so. We, we found appealing it got us far better results. We you, you will do, because of the level of competency of the person that you're dealing with. You're, you're perfectly entitled to ask for, a, for an ombudsman to review it, Obviously there are fewer of them, they've got a lot more experience. A lot of them will be trained lawyers who may be a little bit more critical of the evidence that, than an adjudicator will be as well. What the adjudicators tend to do is ring up the complainant, ask for their version of events as to what was said. They don't want to do that with you. <laughs> They're going to look at your paperwork. So you, they will get a slightly biased view of it, obviously. So um, you're probably right in many cases appealing it. I'm not sure, I know there's a fee to pay if it goes to the Ombudsman. Do you pay an additional fee if you go to the higher level? Do you have to pay extra for that? It's normal. It's, it's worth it if the case is a, is a high value. It's a big one, yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's probably good advice. I would do that in a lot of cases because you get a much higher level of intellect, <coughs> if I put it that way, that will be looking at it. <laughs> Mark, I forgot Des Porter from Concept yeah. Car. Yeah. <laughs> Hi Mark, you probably expected a question or two from me. Yeah. Uh, Andy took my rotten apples and tomatoes off me at the door, but from yeah. what you said so far has been very useful, so thanks for that. Yeah. Question on the uh, Ministry of Justice mm. is that um, we, we decided to try and report some of the claims companies in the early days and the Ministry of Justice mm. were, were not interested in the least. <laughs> They are now. Are they? They are very, very Is it worth our while putting yeah. some what, what you look at, well look at particularly at the ones who just send you the same letter every time. Because that happens a lot. They, they, they get a tell. They may be gone to a lawyer on day one. More hands going at the back. Really good. Um, they, they go to a, a lawyer early on and say, "Draft us a claim letter." So they get this comprehensive claim letter drafted by a lawyer that includes all the different circumstances. And what they're particularly interested in is whether the claim letter that you get is actually reflected in the evidence that the client has given to the CMC. Because what happens a lot of the time is that the CMC send out a brief questionnaire to their, their customer that's got four or five loose questions on it and then just bang out this standard claim letter that bears no resemblance to it. They're majorly hot on that at the moment. So collect, keep your claim letters from the individual CMCs that you get. If you look at them and they're all the same, report them. And they, they will be after them for it. Uh, Mark, George Miller from Moneyway. Hi. Hi Mark. Um, I don't profess to know the terms and conditions of any sort of debt management program, yeah. so maybe you can enlighten me. Is, is there any point in that where a client would or could apply for another car loan? And, and I'm thinking as a lender about sort of treating customers fairly. Yeah, not in, in a debt management program probably not, because the debt management program is not a collective agreement, as, as you will confirm. What all the debt management program is, is a series of individual agreements between the borrower and the lender in each case. So it's not binding, the lender can pull out of it at any time and say, I'm not happy with that monthly installment, I want a bit more. It's, it's a very loose arrangement and it's not, it's not a statutory arrangement either, it's just an informal agreement between everybody. So it has no, there's, there's no overarching agreement that covers it or has conditions on it. If it's an IVA, an individual voluntary arrangement, that's massively different, which is why we do IVAs, but we don't do debt management. I can persuade a bank legally, if somebody is within an IBA, they have to pay the cash into the IBA to the other creditors. I can't persuade them to do it in a debt management. 
In an IBA, it will be a condition in most IBAs that the borrower does not take on additional credit without the approval of their supervisor. You can search, there's something they're, called... Sorry, sorry Mark, their supervisor. Their supervisor, yeah. They have a, there's, a, there's a professional who's usually an accountant called an insolvency supervisor and they administer IBAs. Okay. Um, you can go online, there's something called the insolvency register online, which is free. You can put the name and address of your client in that and it will, it will bring them and tell you for nothing whether they're in an IBA or whether they're bankrupt. Won't tell you if they're in debt management. But if they're in a, if they're in a statutory scheme like an IBA or bankruptcy, it's online, you can access it for nothing. Just put insolvency register in any well-known search engine and it'll find it. Big. Okay, thank you. Well, this is uh, Mark Young from Blue Funding. Hello, Mark. Hi. Um, Hello. <laughs> I'm just really um, a bit of experience with me on the mortgage side of things and also the line, loan side of things. Uh, I've got a number of friends who own rather, lar rather large brokerages over the last 10, 12 years. Yeah. And I had a chat at Christmas with one of the guys who was basically getting letter, letter after letter off CMCs for business that he wrote prior to January 2005. But he wasn't a member of GISC, he didn't subscribe to any of the um, insurance laws at the time. And he was actually, actually writing back to the claims management companies and defending these claims. Mm. When I told him there's absolutely no need to do so, and you just kicked them out straight away, mm. he was enthused and did that. Sent a number of um, responses back to Fox and has heard nothing on the case since. I'm sure everybody here knows that you don't have to answer a claim before then, but just to reiterate, just if you get anything before that and you weren't a member of any organisation, just dismiss it. Absolutely. Um, the point is, from the, CM, the, from the CMC's point of view, they need somewhere to go. If they write to you and you ignore them, they can't go to FOS because they're outside the jurisdiction. If you write to them, you just tell them to get lost. FOS will, FOS will investigate it though, you don't want to invite FOS in. No, I no, appreciate that, but they don't, if, if it's a pre-2005 sale and you're not a member of JISC, then they have no, and you're not in some voluntary scheme other than JISC, then FOS can't make you pay the award. So the CMC has got nowhere to go in those circumstances, so anything pre-January 2005 for PPI. Mortgages were regulated a little bit earlier, they were October 2004, weren't they? But, but for PPI it's January 2005, so anything before that, you wouldn't have been in JISC unless you adapt. Okay, um, Mark, you know, we've known each other all the time, you know, I'm privileged to call you a friend. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming today, it took some, some real... Uh, Let's say have this word balls, okay, so some real balls to do. I think every, you know, a few of the guys actually phoned me personally and said, am I reading this? You're actually getting a guy from a claims manager, from, sorry, from the perceived, from the, from the other side of the, of the tracks, if you like. But I'm going to be honest with you, I think we could probably go on for another hour. Yeah. Um, you know, you can contact Mark through us. Um, I think, Fred, you, you're going to be certainly on to Mark's case afterwards. And, um, you know, some of that stuff there is quite enlightening. And uh, I just really want to thank you ever so much. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Thanks so much. Guys, thank you.